Hi everybody, I'm going to talk a little bit about virtue ethics. So this week in our course we are talking about different ethical theories and how we can apply ethical theories to our lives <clears throat> as well as how we can utilize argumentation to support different ethical theories. So I wanted to just examine first of all virtue ethics. Uh, virtue ethics is a general overarching category for an ethical theory uh, that has been ascribed to Aristotle. So this was uh, Aristotle's ethical theory, or that he presents um, in his, well he has a couple of books on ethics, uh, but primarily the Nicomachean ethics, Aristotle outlines uh, virtue ethics. Now when we're talking about ethics, we need to think about what ethics means in itself. Um, so the way that I kind of like to define ethics, and it's kind of taken from Aristotle, but ethics is uh, the study of the good life. So whenever you hear the word ethics, I want you to think about the study of the, what it means to have a good life. And especially as we're talking about Aristotle here, um, it'll make more sense in relation to virtue ethics. So what does it mean to have a good life? Well, if we're going to study a good life, there are two demarcations here that I like to talk about. There are two different ways that we can think of a good life. One way that we can think of a good life is in relation to the outcomes of our life. So here, we want to think about what the good means in the good life. Well, one form of a good life is an outcome, or another way to say that is a goal, or as Aristotle says, an end. So I'm going to erase this here, but just remember, ethics is the study of the good life. One aspect of living a good life is are the outcomes, the goals, and the ends that we have. So for example, let's say you want to be a doctor. Well then, what is your good, your ultimately good life? Well, the ultimately good life would be to become a doctor. Um, however, the problem is, once you become a doctor, you probably still won't be happy. <laughs> Sorry. How do we find happiness? Well, that's another thing that we'll get to here with virtue ethics. How do we define it? What things will actually make us happy as opposed to just um, giving us temporal pleasure or something of that nature? So one thing when we think of a good life are the ends of life. If we have money, success, fame, honor, children, a good job, health insurance, a retirement account, a 401k. Um, those are some ways that people define the good life. But at the same time, because we're talking about ethics, what is the study of the good life, um, what does it mean to live a good life? It's living action. So another aspect, in addition to the ends that we want in our lives, there are also actions in our lives that we call good or bad or good or evil. Usually people who ascribe to a religious perspective in life will use the terms good and evil. However, if you don't ascribe to a religious perspective, or if you're an atheist, or perhaps a non-theist, um, maybe you're still religious, but you're a non-theist, you'd probably use the terms good and bad. Evil seems to have certain connotations that relate more to theological concepts. We're not going to talk much about that right now, but anyway, the living actions that we have are either good or bad, or good or evil. And so, the good life, in two senses, are the things that we obtain in life, or the ways that we maximize our own potential. And then the other aspect of ethics is actually the actions that we take. So for example, most of us would say um, that killing babies is not a good living action. It's not something that brings about the good. It also doesn't contribute uh, in a good fashion to our own lives. Okay, so as we think about ethics as the study of the good life, we need to think about, especially with Aristotle, the outcomes, goals, and ends of that life, as well as the living actions or the actions that we take in the realm of ethics and morality in our lives. 
And so virtue ethics is an ethic is an ethical system that talks about the good life. Now what is the good life? Well Aristotle says that all human actions aim toward an end. So all actions aim toward an end. The end here is simply the goal or the outcome of the action itself. So for example, right now, you might be listening to this lecture because you want to learn more about philosophy or you want to succeed in this class. So in that case, the end of your action would be perhaps to learn. Maybe the end of your action, you don't care so much about the learning, you care more about your grade. And so in order to get a better grade, you're undertaking this activity. These are the ends of your action. The action itself um, would be watching the video. So watching this video is the action. And all actions aim at an end. And the end is the goal or the outcome of the action. Now I hope most of you are watching this to learn. But I understand that in our United States, even collegiate system, students still don't think in terms of learning as much as they think in terms of grades, piece of paper, a diploma. Again, I can't stress it enough. If you think of college in that manner, if you think of learning in that manner, you're going to miss out on the whole point of learning. And later on in life, you might regret the fact that you spent all this money and took all this time and you don't remember anything from your education. If you jump from one class to the next to the next, just to simply take on the pursuit of a degree, um, you're going to lose all the things that you've studied because you're not emotionally invested in those topics. What else is there to do in life? What's better? Is it best to rush or is it best to immerse ourselves uh, in the material, to, to go to external sources, to, to live and breathe it? Well, the way that I've set it up, it might be a false dichotomy. But still, I would say um, it's the latter. Okay, so Aristotle says all human actions aim toward an end. And what is the ultimate end that all human actions aim at? So for Aristotle, there's an ultimate end. Something that all human actions, at which all human actions aim. Now, when you think about your own life, what is the ultimate goal of your life? When you think, this is the thing that I want out of all other things. This is what I want. Can you think of that thing right now? Just think about, what do you want out of life? A new iPad. So Aristotle says that the ultimate end of life is an iPad. No, he doesn't say that. Uh, Alexis. I'm aiming pretty low here, right? A Bugatti. I always forget how to spell it. It might be, Maybe it's double G, double T. Bugatti. So, no, because all of these things didn't exist uh, in 300 BC. Um, so, obviously, none of these things are the ultimate end of your life. When you die on your tombstone, do you want it to, what do you want it to say? Right? That's the ultimate end that Aristotle's talking about. Do you want it to say, here lies Justin. He had an iPad. Here lies Justin. He drove a Bugatti. No, most of us wouldn't want that on our tombstones. Although, I kind of want something like that because it's kind of funny and ironic, right? Here lies Justin. Uh, he taught courses, he taught online courses and did lectures in his office all by himself on a whiteboard. <laughs> I mean, wouldn't that be funny if you're like all sad and walking in like a graveyard and you saw that? It would be funny to me. And that's, but anyway, apart from that, when you think about what you want out of life, you probably will align, you'll be like, whoa, when you hear what Aristotle says. Aristotle says that all human actions aim at 
the good, what he calls the good. Now, I won't get too far into this because you might say, well, there are some actions that don't aim at the good. Um, like, for example, molesting little kids. Most of us would probably say that's not an action that aims at the good. But if we define the good as a good, then we can see that the actions of a child molester actually aim at a good. What the child molester is saying when they molest children is that my life is better if I enact this action. So what they're saying literally with their actions in the world is that what I'm doing right now is a good. Now, we might not all recognize it as being a good action or let's say a murderer, a serial killer. When the serial killer kills someone, they're aiming at the good for their own life. Because when they kill someone, maybe they feel something different. Maybe they actually feel for the first time. And so, they're, so in their own body and in their own mind, they're saying, this life is better th than the one in which I don't kill people. So don't think of the good as like the good, like some ultimate, holy, pure thing. Just think of all the actions. When we, could, when we act in the world, what we're saying is, my life is going to be better if I do this. Even people who do things like cocaine, right, or crack, what they're saying is, if I do this action, my life is going to be better, even though consciously or psychologically they might be thinking, oh my God, how, why do I keep doing this to myself? I'm destroying myself. I'm blah, blah. But then they're like, give me that crack, right? And, they're, um, and then they're like, ah, oh, I feel better. Now, it's not the good when you smoke crack, but it's a good. It makes your life better. Um, and I'm not speaking from experience here. I have not smoked crack. But the ultimate end that, at which all actions aim is the good, and the highest good, according to Aristotle, is happiness. And when you, th when you thought about the answer to this question, you pro and I said, what do you want out of life? You probably thought, well, I want to be happy. And so that's exactly what Aristotle says. He says, all human actions aim at the goal of happiness. And the word that he uses is eudaimonia. It's often translated as happiness. But the problem in our society is that happiness has taken on a very simplistic um, and kind of like, oh, I'm so happy, I'm like totally wasted right now. <laughs> or like, yeah, I just want some money, I'm so happy. Or, um, I don't know, I can't even think of it, right? Oh, I'm at this amusement park, I'm, I'm so happy. I just rode a roller coaster. So it's better to think of eudaimonia more as human flourishing. This is a better idea, or a better, in my opinion, and I'm not an Aristotle scholar, so you might want to go talk to some people who are, but in my opinion, eudaimonia is better understood as just human flourishing. If you think about what it means to flourish, like what does it mean for a plant to flourish? Well, a plant usually flourishes in a place with the right environment, the right climate. It usually, to, to flourish means to bear fruit, to, to grow strong and beautiful and, and to be what you are. Now think about humans that are flourishing. Think about examples from your own life. Now some people might say, well, you know, really rich people are flourishing. But the problem with that is that we often see really rich people or really famous people who end up not flourishing at all. So for example, people like Lindsay Lohan, and I think she gets abused a lot uh, by people in general, but you see this person who seemingly has everything, right? Fame, popularity, money. Um, she gets paid millions of dollars to recite lines in movies and things of that nature. So you would think, oh, that must be a flourishing human, but what ends up happening in her life? And that's a simplistic example, but she kind of continues this spiral, right? The spiral of self-destruction. Now, I don't want to say, you know, that's just a simple example that we all know and that we can all agree with. But if you ask yourself, do I spiral in self-destruction? I think most of us would say yes. I think most of us would say that we tend to make bad decisions and we consistently make those bad decisions. Have you ever been with somebody who systematically isn't nice to you? Whether it's a, a relationship or a family relationship, 
Yes, right? We don't want to be in relationships with people who are healthy and calm and normal because that's not fun, right? That doesn't make me happy. Why is that? Why do we seek out things that destroy us? Well, there's a psychoanalytic response to that question. There's a psychological response to that question. There's a sociological response, a philosophical response. But we tend to do things that cycle us in destruction. But every now and then we see a human that's flourishing. We see a human that doesn't make those decisions. We see a human that tends to make good decisions in their life in relation to their family, their friends, their job. They seem to be happy. They seem to be successful. But they're successful, but they're not arrogant, right? They're happy, but they're not annoying. They're loving, but they're not bleh, right? Whatever bleh <laughs> means. They're flourishing. And when we see those people, so we think in our heads, wow, I want to be like that person. Why do you want to be like Mother Teresa? Why do we want to be like Martin Luther King? Why do we want to be like Snooky, right? Well, we don't want to be like Snooky. Why don't we want to be like Snooky? Precisely because we recognize that that human is not flourishing. And what you're doing right now by attending college is that you are becoming what you are. And this is the theme that I like to continue to come back to in my ethics courses. Become what you are. This is virtue ethics. This is arete. So when you reflect on who you are, and everybody says, as a person, I don't like when people say, who I am as a person, because there's no other thing that I can be. I'm only a person, so it seems kind of redundant. But anyway, when you think about and you reflect on who you are, you see something, usually. And usually what we see when we reflect on what we are, who we are, is our ideal self. We, if we're critical thinkers, we also see our weaknesses and we also see our failures. And some of us see our weaknesses and failures way more than we can see our positive strengths or those things that we can develop. But the thing that we all see is that we aren't fully developed. We are not what we know that we are or what we could be. And so when you think about virtue, virtue is the maximization of everything that you know already that you are. Now we continually fail. Have you ever done something and then you say to yourself, oh man, why did I do that? That's not me. I'm not that kind of person. Well again, you're consulting whatever it is inside of us you're consulting your own reflection of what you know that you are. And so what Aristotle's telling us to do with the virtue ethics is to become what we know that we already are. Now the problem with that is that it's really hard to become what we know that we are. And this kind of goes back to what I was saying earlier about the wheel of self-destruction. You cannot become the loving person that you want to be so long as you continually spin your wheels in violent or degrading relationships. But it's really hard for us, some of us to break out of those cycles, and for me too. You can't become your intellectual ideal unless you go to college, or unless you open books and start to read them on your own, or unless you learn how to do a programming system at work unless you utilize your wasted time that you usually spend watching Game of Thrones, like I did. Anybody watch first episode of season three? Pretty good. Exciting. But what should, what should I have been doing while I watched Game of Thrones? I should have been becoming what I, what I know that I am. Now, are we able to engage popular culture and still become what we are? Probably. But I think we all know the level where our lives get out of control. And that takes me to the next part of virtue ethics. So for Aristotle, in order to become what you are, in order to learn how to flourish, because in human flourishing comes this ultimate form of happiness, 
And again, this is not the happiness of like, oh, I'm so wasted, I'm so happy. Really, we're not happy. And the reason why we get wasted is because we're fundamentally not happy. And in that moment, our abandonment and absurdity and meaninglessness disappears because our mind becomes overwhelmed with alcohol. And then we, we feel like everything's okay. And then we wake up the next day and we realize that, no, in fact, the alcohol didn't release us from our anxiety. It didn't release us from the fact that we don't know what we are, what our meaning is. Um, so again, we're not talking about that form of happiness. But in order to maximize a virtue, Aristotle says that we have to choose the mean between two extremes. So maximizing a virtue equals choosing the intermediate in all actions. And there are different types of virtues. There are intellectual and moral virtues that Aristotle talks about. There are the virtues of the mind and then the virtues of our action in the world by which we use our mind and our body to perform these virtues. So Aristotle says that there's a mean, and when you see the word mean, remember from your, uh, your math course, the mean is just the average. So there's an average action between too much excess and too little. The defect. So too much and excess, too little is the defect. Okay, so Aristotle says that all of our actions should, we should try to find the balance. Now the balance is not just the average, the same across the board. To find a balance, Aristotle says that you have to recognize in each situation the environment, the time, the people that you're with. You have to recognize um, how to act in the right way, how to do it at the right time, uh, how to do it in the right measure. So for example, one of the means, now when you choose the mean, you're choosing the virtue. So choosing the mean means you're choosing the virtue. And so one of the virtues, according to Aristotle, is courage. Now, the amount of courage it takes to fight heroically in a war is going to be different from the amount of courage it takes, let's say, somebody who's afraid of snakes to, you know, touch the boa constrictor at Billy Bob's alligator and snake farm. Um, so you can see that there are different forms of courage, or perhaps the courage that it might take somebody who's an adult who never fully learned how to read to walk into a classroom and admit that they don't know how to read and start down the path um, of literacy. That's a different type of courage. And so Aristotle would say all three different scenarios require a different mean. You have to take into consideration where you are, what time it is, how much you need uh, in relation to all those things. Too much courage we call foolhardiness. Too much courage is why YouTube exists, right? You get like somebody who's like, I'm gonna ride this bike off a cliff, <laughs> right? And then, Rah! and then they like fall down the cliff, right? Or somebody's like, I'm gonna break a land speed record on a bicycle and I'm gonna go 200 miles an hour. What do you think is gonna happen, right? If you have too much courage, it's foolhardiness and it always ends up in a broken skateboard and, and the gooch and you know, like these situations that you see um, where people end up killing themselves. So for example, there was a guy I went to high school with um, snowmobiling in Wisconsin. And instead of um, kind of taking it easy and going up to the edge of this path, uh, he just decided that he was going to go vroom, 60 miles an hour. And he didn't know that there was a cliff there, a 30 foot cliff or so, and he just went off the edge uh, and was killed. So too much is foolhardiness, but what's too little courage called? 
you probably thought of it, cowardice. If you don't have enough courage, then we call you a coward. And so the virtue in every situation is finding that perfect mean or average or intermediate between the extreme of too much and too little. So for example, in life you've probably seen people who have too little courage. And I'm talking to you people out there who are afraid of spiders. Now, if you live in a place where the spiders are extremely dangerous um, or violent or can run 60 miles an hour and have claws and fangs um, and can overtake you, then yeah, perhaps you ought to be afraid of spiders. But anyone who gets afraid of insects in that moment has too little courage. They are a coward, and I'm not trying to like single people out here, but if we think logically and rationally about a tiny creature that just moves and lives, just like you and I, it's in its bug world. So I'm a beetle, I've got my multifaceted eyes and my wings, and, right? and then all of a sudden there's this creature that's so afraid of me that it's going to stomp on me to death. Right? But what? I'm a beetle. All I can do is like land on you. Right? And then when I do land on you, you freak out even more, right? And you like, you kill me, right? So in those instances, you know, it's cowardice. And we all are afraid of different things. But when you're afraid of something, again, Aristotle says you have to fear in the right measure and in the right way at the right time. If you're afraid of snakes and you're at the zoo and a boa constrictor is behind bulletproof glass, you need not be afraid. Now, if you're out in the savanna and there's a lion and there's nobody around, yes, then you need to be very afraid, right? But if you're at the zoo and there's a lion and it's separated by the, the ditch or whatever across the way, then you don't need to be afraid. Um, and so that's part about, of, of fearing at the right time. So again, virtue ethics is all about choosing the mean or the intermediate in relation to different actions in our lives. And there are different virtues, and there are some things that can't be virtues. Like for example, lying. For Aristotle, he says, there's no way to lie at the right time, in the right way, to the right person. But, here's the question. What about the example of the Nazi searching for Jews? And this is the example that tends to come up a lot in philosophy as the counterexample to extreme statements. But if I'm hiding Jews in my house, right, and I'm living in World War II, like France, let's say, if you want a great representation of this, watch the very beginning of the movie Inglorious Bastards. It's what I usually show. So I'm hiding Jews in my house. Is there, am I more virtuous by lying to the Nazis and hiding the Jews in the right way at the right time? Or am I more virtuous by not lying and living out my ideal and then allowing them to kill the people who are hiding in my floorboards? Well, I personally would say I'm more virtuous in lying, right? Now, I can't really justify that 100%, but I believe that, that it's a stronger position than claiming that, it's, that you one ought to tell the truth in that instance, because then I would say you're partially responsible for the death of those people, and I consider those types of murders to be a lot worse than, than a lie, especially to prevent those, a lie that tr is attempting to prevent those murders. Okay, so virtue ethics, and there's a lot more that Aristotle talks about. He talks about the different types of virtues, that there are intellectual virtues, there's wisdom and uh, practical wisdom or prudence. So practical wisdom is the art of knowing what to do at the right time. Uh, the way I like to think of it is, um, I really like the example of somebody who, can, who makes beautiful furniture, right? Or is able to make beautiful paintings. They have uh, practical wisdom, they have prudence, in the sense that they are able to create in the world in such a manner that they bring about something more beautiful, or they shape an object um, from other materials or other substances 
and, and they create something that can actually connect with multiple people and make the world a better place. Um, although I guess that's more te technical um, wisdom. But at the same time, I, I believe that, that if you're good at the arts or at creating things, then you, you display a certain form of practical wisdom. Um, there are people that know how to manage people really well and how to make other people happy, how to mediate conflicts between people. And that's another form of practical wisdom, prudence, being able to bring about the good in your own life through actions. And then Aristotle talks about uh, the other intellectual virtue, which is wisdom. And Sophia, right? In Greek, so uh, you might have learned that f uh, philosophy is philosophia, the love of wisdom. And so Aristotle says that wisdom, Sophia, is another aspect of the mind um, that one can maximize one's virtue in. And that would be more of the theoretical thinking. So not so much, oh, I'm really good at shaping this object. I have this practical wisdom. I'm able to create this beautiful car or I'm able to fix this engine, uh, intellectual wisdom would be like, I understand the substances of reality. I understand the laws that, that guide my behavior or human behavior. I understand theories and metaphysics and foundations. I understand the foundations of logic and, um, and mathematics. Those things would be fall underneath wisdom. So we have the intellectual virtues and then we have the moral virtues. The moral virtues are the ones uh, in which we act out, like courage and generosity um, and friendship. Friendship is a virtue for Aristotle. Okay, so little overview. Remember, virtue ethics is all about this. Becoming what you are, what you know you are, and what you are not yet. So it's all about maximizing the traits, your strengths, minimizing your weaknesses. Uh, there's been a reemergence of virtue ethics in recent literature, um, especially within feminist circles. And uh, it's becoming more and more popular now, uh, a resurgence. But just think of it as becoming what you are, maximizing your potential. And then for Aristotle, he says that all of our actions aim at human flourishing. And so Ultimately, in virtue ethics for Aristotle, if you're acting well in the world, you are becoming, you are flourishing. So you flourish when you act well. And most people probably agree with something like this in their everyday discourse. This is why probably most of us don't lie to people or we don't purposefully hurt others, or we don't just punch someone in the face, we tend to believe that the actions that we take in the world are somehow repaid to us. Some people take it from a theological perspective, other people from a fatalistic perspective. Um, but for most of us, if we were to act in the world in a violent or destructive manner, we wouldn't live well in ourselves. When most people, let's say, accidentally kill another person, or maybe even purposefully, or in the heat of the moment, they can no longer live with themselves. Right? This is precisely what happens to people when they're forced to do actions in war and other contexts that they're not emotionally prepared to do that is not representative of who they are. They can't live with it. And the reason why is because um, because they know that that's not really the person that they are and they felt compelled to do these things against their will. And so then it's hard for them to flourish. But it's hard for all of us to flourish. And so in virtue ethics, the ultimate goal is acting well in the world, both in relation to the mind and then in relation to the body and using your body for good, for good deeds with the ultimate goal of becoming an ultimately happy and flourishing individual. And that's virtue ethics, again with a lot of mistakes and a lot of simplifications, but nonetheless that's a little intro to virtue ethics for this week.